uh, the story of Ruth, the story of redemption today. Now, actually, uh, this is just me talking. From me having read the Bible, I would, I would not entitle this or call this a story of redemption. It's not about salvation. It's also not about eternal damnation. Okay? It's just a, a story about a person that occurred um, um, more than 3,000 years ago. Right? 3,500 years ago, this lady lived. And she lived in circumstances, as I described to you last week, uh, on multiple occasions I mentioned to you that in the society at that time, uh, there were a, a lot more women than there were men for a variety of reasons. Now, there, there are things that I'm going to talk about today that, that aren't in the lesson material. Uh, you know, I do that routinely so that you can get a background because you've got the lesson material in the little, little book that we have and so forth. But what happened over here in the time of the judges in Israel, uh, right along here at Jerusalem, there was a famine in the land. So there was a family of four, a man and his wife. And the man, first of all, let's sympathize with the man. He couldn't provide for his family. He had two little boys, and I say little, I don't know what their ages were, but they were still dependent on him. And there was such a famine in the land that he couldn't provide for his wife and two children. So what he did was he made his way probably around the south end of the Dead Sea, which is right here, into the land of Moab. Now the land of Moab is um, the descendants of Lot. You remember we studied some months ago, we studied uh, Lot and his two daughters escaping from Sodom and Gomorrah and the two daughters made up among themselves, look, our daddy doesn't have a, an heir to carry on the name and so it's, it's up to us. We, 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 got, we got this situation here where we, we need to provide, help our dad provide and have him an heir so they got him drunk, and one of them laid with him that night, and there was conception. And then they got him drunk the next night, and the other one laid with him, and there was conception. And the two babies that were born were Ammon and Moab. Okay? And from, from times after that, there was considerable strife between these people and the, the, the what, what I'm going to call, for lack of a better description, and I don't mean to imply that they were pure, but I'm going to call them pure Jews. Okay? The pure Jewish blood that was on this side of the river and on this side of the Dead Sea that's right there, there was continual conflict. Okay, can you imagine one of these fellows with a wife and two little boys that he had to provide for and he couldn't because of the famine in the land that he would actually pick up and go to a, 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 an enemy's, well he went around the north end of, of, uh, of the Dead Sea or come down around the south into the land of Moab, that's where he ended up. And he didn't do real well there. The scripture indicates that the, the man uh, got sick, that he died. The two boys had grown, couldn't, um, I don't know, 
See, I'm, I'm, I'm just telling you what real life is when I read the whole book. Is that these two guys couldn't control themselves. They ended up marrying a couple of women in the land of Moab. And then when the daddy died, shortly after, one of the sons died. And shortly after that, the other son died. And that left the mama from Jerusalem with two foreign um, antagonistic daughters-in-law. Now, the two daughters-in-law, I don't mean to say that intentionally, that the, that the, that the two daughters-in-law uh, had strife in them. I don't mean that. I'm just saying that they were not Jewish. So they were the fan. They, their background was antagonistic toward the background of their mama-in-law. So after a while, mama decides to go home to Jerusalem. And these two girls say, we'll go with you. And she says, no, 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 no. You stay here. It'd be better for you to stay here. Uh, let me just go along. I said, no, 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 no. We're going with you home. And they did. So all three of them made the journey back from the land of Moab, either around the Dead Sea that way or around the Dead Sea this way to get back home. Now, all of this occurred during the time of the judges. Now there was a while back when we studied the judges. We knew that we saw that when there was a good judge, people prospered. And that judge died, and then a bad judge would come along and people would be down here. And then they'd get to crying out to the Lord and the Lord would provide them with a good judge. So the bad judge would die and a good judge would come along and the people would prosper again. Is this kind of a yo-yo sort of thing that was occurring in Judges. Well, this story in the book of Ruth, or the, it's called by her name, Ruth, occurred during the time of the Judges. So the only part of the books of the Bible, see, I don't know if you know this, but my little, my, my little helper was ingenious in, in, in putting a a map superimposed on the books of the Bible, and this is all that existed. Uh, and, and this wasn't written, certainly, and I'm not sure that this even was written. Joshua probably was, and all of these five were. Don't know about the book of Judges, but Ruth, this story that we're going to read today occurred during the time of the Judges, okay? Now, there's some very important, uh, in my mind, um, lessons here in, in the problems caused by, uh, I'm, I'm just, uh, I, I don't mean any bad thing or connotation by this, but I'm going to call it interracial marriages, okay? The, pro the problems have to do with culture, it has to do with Moab over here, worship, they worshiped idols. They didn't worship God. So these people that worship God come over to a place that worships idols. And the sons marry two women that worship <laughs> idols. Or had been grown up, they, they, they were raised up in houses where idols were worshiped. So there's just, a conflict uh, from a spiritual standpoint, I'm talking about the interracial problems, let alone the physical ones of what goes on in society with all the biases that there are, which are, of course, uh, hot buttons even in, in our, our day and time now. But here's a daddy in Jerusalem who can't provide for his, his family, and, and he... He thinks he's doing good by going off to find a place to earn a living. And maybe he was able to earn a living and maybe he wasn't. I, I, don't, I don't know. But what ended up there 
was he ended up with, uh, of course he was deceased, but he ended up with two daughters-in-law that now weren't uh, in their own society. They weren't really acceptable because they had married people from over here. Well, their children wouldn't be. Because their children wouldn't be able to go in the temple. Now, yeah, but yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm just saying even the girl, even the women themselves, there, there's no men there really that wants to marry a woman that is a widow of a guy that lived on this side. Oh, okay, you're saying for that. Okay, yeah. Yeah. I'm just saying yeah. that even their children, according to the Jews, wouldn't be accepted to worship in a temple. Yeah, but I'm talking about the other side of the, the, other side, the, the other side there, of Dead Sea right now. They stayed over there. Yeah. I'm, I'm saying that if they had stayed over there, those two ladies didn't have much opportunity to remarry. The pagans don't care. Excuse me? The pagans don't care. <laughs> <laughs> pagans don't care. They'll do anything. Well, you, you say that, but once a pagan has married a Jew, uh, then the other pagans don't, don't particularly care for them because because of that. That's my take on it, okay? And and maybe I'm wrong, I don't know, in that well, regard. Isn't that why Naomi was telling them to stay there? Excuse me? Her, isn't that why Naomi was trying to tell them to stay she there? She was telling them that it would be better for them there than for them to come over here. Right, cause because over be here they didn't have, have even, even less chance of they, finding somebody right. to, to marry them. <clears throat> so, so she was trying to get them to, to, to have the best chance possible by, by trying to get them to stay there. And yet most of the, the men, virtually, I'm, I, don't, I don't have any way of proving this, but virtually all of the men aren't going to come near them because they've been with the Jew. Okay. Uh, so, in, in spite of the fact that, now, do you see all of the trouble that was caused by this fellow that couldn't make a living here, and he went, he went over here in the enemy's territory? And I mean, that that's missed in this biblical story. You know, there's no, there's nobody that, there, there's nothing here in scripture that talks about that. But those are the cultural and societal things <coughs> and conditions that occurred at the time. Okay? But you were alluding to this, I think, last week, that if you were in a situation where you needed food, you would make do with what you had. And that's exactly what he did. Right? He, he did the best he could do. It's a famine. There's no food. You know, uh, listen, I can remember as a kid growing up when 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 there were times we didn't we didn't have much food, and my dad did everything he could do, uh, uh, taking on extra jobs and so forth uh, to provide for his family. And I think that that's what this guy did. But he he moved to uh, to greener pastures, or what he thought was you know the old adage is that. Grass is greener on the other side of the fence. In this case, it was greener on the other side of the lake. Okay, so he, he went he went around the lake here. But let's look at let's start reading. I hope you have your books open to the book of Ruth. That's right after the book of Judges, by the way. I mean Joshua and the Judges and then there's Ruth. Okay, a little short book, only four chapters. I don't know if we'll get it all read today, but we're <coughs> going to get the important stuff. But but first of all, I'm going to start. <laughs> I want to start in the book of Judges. But I want to only read one verse. And that's a prophecy. We won't finish Ruth today. <laughs> yeah, it could, be, it could be. Thank you. Thank you. Could be. Could be because we got a late start because the technician didn't yeah, show up and start and get set up. At the, I don't know. Okay. Uh, 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 the last verse in the book of Judges. So that would be right before the first verse in the book of Ruth. 
right? Look what it says. It says, in those days there was no king in Israel. But here's the important part. Every man did that which was right in his own sight. Everybody had their own rights. Does that sound at all familiar with our society and the United States of America today? Everybody, everybody did right. Everybody got their rights, and they assert their rights. Pagans. Pagans. <laughs> Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Now the book of Ruth, chapter 1, verse 1. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled. See, I was pointing that out to you a minute ago. This, this happened in the days when the judges ruled. That there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, he went to sojourn in the country of Moab. He and his wife and his two sons. And the name of the man was Elimelech. And the name of his wife, Naomi. And the name of his two sons, Malad and Kalian. Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. So Ephrathites gives us an indication of, of what portion of the tribe that they were uh, I mean, it doesn't mean a lot to us here, but they were Ephrathites and they lived in Bethlehem, Judah. And they came into the country of Moab and continued there, and Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left, and her two sons. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of one was Orpah. That's sort of like Oprah. <laughs> but I think that that's only yeah, her, her, her mother misspelled it. Yeah. Just, she was trying to name it after that. Or dyslexic. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I, that's what I heard. Well, I mean, supposedly it's true. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. And they dwelled there about ten years. And Malin and Kalion, or Kylan, I guess it would be Kylian. Yeah, Kylian, yeah, that's good. Chilion. They died also, both of them. And the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab for she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. In other words, the famine was over. And she heard that. Wherefore, verse 7, she went forth out of the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return unto the land of Judah. And Naomi said unto her two, da two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you, as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. I imagine a very sad time. Verse 10. And they said unto her, Oh, surely we will return with thee unto thy people. And Noemi said, Turn again, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb that, that they may be your husbands? Who's Turn Noemi? Say again? He said Noemi. I don't know who that is. Naomi? <laughs> I'm messing with you. He said Noemi. <laughs> uh, okay. 
Uh, we get uh, that. What causes that kind of confusion? We don't think our worship uh, leader was alive back uh, 2,500 uh, years ago. Or thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for catching the mistake and letting me know right away. So, so I don't have to correct it next week. <coughs> Verse 12, turn again, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have an husband also tonight and should also bear sons, would ye tarry for them till they were grown? Would ye stay for them from having husbands? Nay, my daughters, for it grieveth me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Well, let me point out to you there that the hand of the Lord didn't go out against her. Her husband let, left Jerusalem and went off into this other country. And, and then, for whatever reason, died. Maybe the hand of the Lord went out against him that caused him to die because he went off into an, an idolatrous country. I, I, don't, I don't know. But she is uh, is affected by something that somebody else did. Some other choice that was made. And it's being interpreted here as though the Lord, the hand of the Lord, or she's looking at it as though the hand of the Lord is against her. But I'm suggesting to you that that we should look at it a, a little different than yeah, that. Well, excuse me. Wouldn't you say though, in a sense, it had because it didn't seem like she was very strong of faith. Uh, I. I can I could say that or agree uh, uh, generally with that, and only that there's no indication that she resisted moving from here over to there. The other side of that being that uh, in prior lessons we pointed out that that the women were just a property; and they had no say in anything, no right to vote, no influence or whatever. But but. I have to believe that, that wives had some influence over their husband and where they moved to. Uh, so in in that yeah, regard... Well, she might have been the one in his ear telling him to go over there. It could have been that. Uh, but the next verse is what makes me think she's weak in faith. But anyway, sorry. Well, no, it's, it's, it's entirely okay. The, I'm telling you that in this story of Ruth, which is held out for us to be a story of redemption, which it is, but it's not a story about salvation, not a story about damnation. It doesn't, doesn't have anything to do with heaven or hell. It has to do with real life circumstances in the, life, in the lives of uh, Jewish people and their uh, cousin brothers over here. See, these, uh, these people were direct descendants of, of Abraham, and these people were descendants of Lot in an incestuous uh, circumstance, and uh, God, wasn't, God wasn't over here uh, because they were, they were over here busy worshiping idols. But I don't think that it's so much the race as it is for the gods. Those people, I don't think about it, it cares so much about the race. He cares more about, you know, a Christian marrying a, a pagan. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. I, 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 agree, I agree very much with that. I he, think that's what you're saying. Yeah, that's what I'm, that's what I'm saying. I, I don't think that there's anything wrong with interracial marriages if they worship the same God. Uh, I don't even think there's anything wrong uh, with with an Asian buying an American car. <laughs> there was nothing that, well, it wasn't, Rahab was the mother or grandmother of Boaz. 
Jesus. Oh, we'll, 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 we'll get there in a little bit. Yeah. All right. Uh, uh, verse 14. And they lifted up their voice, this sad situation here, and they wept again. They just kept on weeping. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her. And she said, and so the indication there is that Orpah kissed and stood back, but Ruth embraced and held on. Okay? Verse 15. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law has gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God shall be my God. Where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. Now, this, this is an indication to me that from over the lessons that we've had that I've indicated to you that nations move in, in groups, but there are people within that nation that doesn't like the way the nation is going. Okay? Oh, you mean like the United States? Mm -hmm. Could be like the United States. <laughs> uh, so, so God deals with individuals within a group of of pagans, knuckleheads. There we go. Uh, God, God will have a relationship with the people, with with somebody in a church, even where the whole church isn't moving in the same direction. But you can still have a relationship with God. And what I think is that this daughter, the daughter-in-law that, that uh, Ruth had was one of those people over here in this nation. Now, I've told you a story before, and will again, and maybe again, some other time later, that some years ago when we used to have our class in, in the room down at the other end of the hall, uh, we had a little Chinese fellow that attended church here. His name was James. I don't know what his Chinese name was, but his American name was James. So James, James, uh, I got pretty well acquainted with him, but now I've lost contact with him. I don't know where, where James is. But he, uh, he was imported here from China, immigrated here from China into the home, a Christian home, in some town, and I don't remember the town, in Missouri, where they have a university. And this boy James had been accepted to that university, and this local family adopted him. And, and, and he was enough of a Christian. After he got his degree, he came to Houston to find work, and he did. He was successful at that. He had uh, a, a nice job, as I recall, in engineering and computing, some, something or other. I don't remember exactly the story. Anyway, I, I asked James, just getting acquainted, what's the, what's the principal religion in, in China from when you were growing up? He said, oh, there's no religion at all. So officially, China is atheistic. And they teach their uh, they teach their kids from kindergarten. He said, from kindergarten up, I was taught that there was no God. And I said, well, how is it then that you are worshiping uh, God? That you've been converted or whatever you come in? He said, inside, I just always knew better. So I think that's, that's my opinion, is that's this daughter-in-law over here in Moab 
that somehow she just always knew better. And so she envisioned herself being over here and was happy to have gotten to have been transported. Uh, that's, that's the best explanation I can give you there and, and story I can give you to illustrate. Um, so Oprah went back to her pagan. Yeah, yeah. Orpah, Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth claimed to her. Verse 16, and Ruth said, uh, I've already read that. Didn't I? Didn't I? Oh, maybe. Number 16. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee, for whither thou goest... Yeah, I have read this. <coughs> so this is Ruth. That came from Edom. Over here. With no Amy. Naomi. Okay. Ruth. Oprah. Ruth, no, Oprah's <laughs> over here in Moab. <coughs> so Ruth come over here and, and she gets a whole book. And four chapters. That's longer than, than some of the books in the Bible. Mm -hmm. And it happened during the time that the judges were going on. When there was very little or no Bible at all and yet somehow God was communicating with people including the insides of Ruth, a Moabitess lady. Verse 17, Where thou diest will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. When she saw that she was, that she is Naomi now, uh, that when Naomi saw that Ruth was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. Now earlier, I, th I think I made a misstatement when I said that they both came over here, but then Oprah went back. I don't think, I don't think Oprah ever went over uh, Orpah. <laughs> Oprah never went Oprah, over Oprah, Oprah, Oprah. Yeah, never went over. She stayed over here. But Ruth, the two of them came, okay? <coughs> New paragraph. So they too went until they came to Bethlehem. And it came to pass when they were come to Bethlehem that all the city was moved about them. And they said, Is this Naomi? And she said unto them, Call me not Naomi. Call me Mara. For the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. <coughs> now, what she's talking about there is that her husband died and both of her sons died. And her family hasn't developed. She has no grandchildren. She did, the Lord has just dealt. That, that was a sign of that sort of thing. Uh, in, in those days, if you were blessed of the Lord, you would have little kids all over the place. And if the Lord didn't, uh, if he wasn't happy with you, you wouldn't have any other children. And that's, I think, what she is talking about there. She lost her men. Okay? Now, Last week I talked about there being an overpopulation of women, an underpopulation of men, but I talked about it for a different reason because of wars and conflicts and so forth where so many men were getting killed. Uh, in, in this particular case, I want to I be sure that you understand that, that these women were marked because they had gone from the pure side of the Dead Sea and, and went and <laughs> consorted with the enemy. And now they're coming back. Okay. So the whole town knows that Naomi has come back. Verse 21. I went out full and the Lord has brought me home again empty. Why then call ye me Naomi? Seeing the Lord hath testified against me and the Almighty hath afflicted me. 
So Naomi returned and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law with her, which returned out of the country of Moab. And they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of barley harvest. Now, barley is harvested, as they say, in the early spring. Let's call it the month of April. Could be late March, could be into early May. But let's call it roughly April our, by our calendar. Verse uh, 1 of chapter 2. And Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabitess said unto Naomi, Let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him, in whose sight I shall find grace. And she said unto her, Go, my daughter. And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and her hap was to light on a part of the field belonging unto Boaz, who was of the kindred of Elimelech. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said unto the reapers, The Lord be with you, you reapers. And they answered him, The Lord bless thee, boss. <laughs> then said Boaz unto his reapers, unto his servant that was set over the reapers, Whose damsel is this? And the servant that was set over the reapers answered and said, Now the servant that was set over that, that, that would be a foreman, okay, supervisor. He said, It is the Moabitish damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. And she said uh, to the reapers, to the, to the supervisor, Please, I pray you, supervisor, let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and hath continued even from the morning until now that she tarried a little in the house. Now that paragraph is just simply saying she's worked all day long without even a break. She, hasn't even, she, she did go in the house uh, for just a little bit, but not long. She didn't tarry in there. She came back. She's been gleaning ever since. Now, let me tell you that Part of the law that Moses wrote up here, God, God told him what to say, was for, for landowners to, to leave the corners of the fields without harvesting them. For the homeless, for the poor, for whoever to come and pick the fruit that's left. Whatever, whatever the fruit being, whatever vegetable is being grown, or or whatever the crop is, and and so that's what's going on here. That 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 particular guy is following God's law. Verse eight. Then said Boaz unto Ruth, Hearest thou not, my daughter? Go not to glean in another field, neither go from hence, but abide here fast by my maidens. Let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap, and go thou after them. Have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? And when thou art athirst, go unto the vessels and drink of that which the young men have drawn. Now, all he's saying here are just kind things to Ruth. And and he, he he's saying, I've told all these guys, these reapers, reapers here, don't 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 touch her. Uh, that's an indication that he he's already got his eye on her. Uh, and so none of these other guys <coughs> if you're the boss you tell your workers, you know, you, you leave that one alone. All the rest of these you can harass if you want to, but just leave that one alone. But <clears throat> now, of course, in our day and time, <clears throat> the laws are so bad. Uh, and when I say so bad, I, I don't even know really uh, how to describe that. But 
they they are such that if if I was still employed, which I'm not, I've been retired for a bunch of years now. But back in my corporate job that I used to have, I, I employed a bunch of women. But I wouldn't today. I just our men. Just to not have the the kind of problem that exists with with women accusing men of all the things that you can think of. I'm not thinking of them. Misogynistic. Yeah, yeah, I am one of those. But you said you would hire all men, is that legal? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, yeah, probably not, because you're supposed to do it without respect to, to gender or whatever. I, you know, and I there was to, no gender. Uh, yeah, I know. There's too many genders. To, too many genders to pick from nowadays. But, but uh, and I can remember in the early '70s in Dallas when I was responsible for hiring, uh, hiring and staffing the office, uh, and I used uh, a couple of employment agencies. Uh, to do that, and I would tell them, I want, I only want blondes. Only send me blondes. They brought you a bunch of blonde men. No, <laughs> they just, uh, just uh, if you if you just think about it a minute, you'll get it. But the the point is, they were all white girls. Uh, I, I didn't want to get into all of those other problems, and it was during my tenure there that that women started wearing pantsuits, and I said to, to the ladies in my office, uh, "Sorry, but uh, I want you to look like a lady, and uh, no pantsuits." Well, things things obviously have changed over time, and I wouldn't I don't have that same attitude now, but that's the attitude that I had uh, at that time. And here's what I said to him: I said, if I let you wear pants suits, the next thing you're going to be asking, you're going to be asking me if you can come with a bare midriff or something like that. You're just going to keep on keeping on. And somewhere I've got to draw the line. So here's the line. And anyway, I'm <laughs> I don't know where to find that in the book of Ruth. Uh, <laughs> he was talking about bringing in the sheaves, so yeah. that has something to do with it. Yeah, verse 10. Then she fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground and said unto him, Why have I found grace in thine eyes that thou shouldst take knowledge of me? Seeing I am a stranger, now, seeing a stranger, that just means that she's from over here. She's not a local girl. She's from over there. So why, why do you, um, why do, why do you give me grace? And Boaz, verse eleven, answered and said unto her, It hath fully been showed me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thine husband. And how thou hast left thy father and thy mother in the land of thy nativity, and art come unto a people which thou knewest not heretofore. The Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust. Then she said, Let me find favor in thy sight, my Lord, for that thou hast comforted me, and for that thou hast spoken friendly unto thine handmaid, though I be not like unto one of thine handmaidens. And Boaz said unto her, At mealtime come thou hither, and eat of the bread, and dip thy morsel in the vinegar. And she sat beside the reapers, and he reached her parched corn, and she did eat, and was sufficed, and left. And when she was risen up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her glean, even among the sheaves. Meaning, that, that's the sheaves, are, that, that's the part they've already 
uh, they've already harvested. And so, so it's not just our picking up what was left that they didn't harvest, but he's saying, uh, let, let, let her get stuff out of what you've already harvested. And reproach her not, at the end of verse 15, 16, and let fall also some of the handfuls of purpose for her, and leave them that she may glean them, and rebuke her not. So she gleaned in the fields until even, and beat out that she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah of barley. Now that was, I don't know how much an ephah was. I mean, we've got a table of measurements. I, I didn't one look. bushel. One bushel, okay. So a bushel, that's, that's, that's well, well you, can, you can eat a while on a bushel of barley. That is. And she took it up and went into the city, and her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned. And she brought forth and gave to her that she had reserved after she was sufficed. And her mother-in-law said unto her, Where is thou gleaned today? And where wroughtest thou? Blessed be he that did take knowledge of thee, and she showed her mother-in-law with whom she had wrought, and said, The man's name with whom I wrought today is Boaz. And they only said, Boaz? Are you kidding me? <laughs> Blessed be he of the Lord, who hath not left off his kindness to the living and to the dead. And Naomi said unto her, Boaz is near kin to us, one of our next kinsmen. And Ruth the Moabitess said, He said unto me also, Thou shalt keep fast by my young men until they have ended all my harvest. And Naomi said unto Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter that thou go out with his maidens, that they meet thee not in any other field. In other words, she's just saying, stick with Boaz. Don't, don't, don't go off. Don't, don't think the grass is greener on the other side. Stay with Boaz's maidens. So, verse 23, she kept fast by the maidens of Boaz to glean unto the end of barley harvest and of wheat harvest and dwelt with her mother-in-law. Now, I wish there was time, but uh, Tom's prophecy is coming true <laughs> and, and, and we're not going to finish uh, reading this chapter. I want you to skip to uh, chapter 4, verse 18. You got it? Now, these are the generations of Pharaoh's. And Pharaoh's begat Hezron, and Hezron begat Ram, and Ram begat Amenadab, and Amenadab begat Nashon, and Nashon begat Simon, and Simon begat Boaz. So what we're doing is looking at the family tree a little bit here. It's giving us a little bit of history, a few generations. Verse 21, Simon begat Boaz, and then Boaz begat Obed, and Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat King David. <laughs> well, wow is right. And we see that this lady that came from over here, that I'm suggesting to you that even though there was a pagan nation worshiping idols, that somehow... She, like my Chinese friend James, knew better. And when she had the opportunity to come around here to Jerusalem with her mother-in-law to worship the real God, she did it. And then we see the result of, of that sort of thing. I would like you to turn 
Uh, you see, you, see uh, you guys, you, you've got your little books. You can read, uh, you, even the Bible, you can read chapters 3 and 4 to finish uh, the book of, uh, of Ruth if you want. But turn to, to the book of Matthew in the New Testament, the very first book in the New Testament. And I'm going to read some stuff to you that is is boring, but is, I think, important and it has some important little gleanings of things. Now we've been talking about her gleaning from the field that had been harvested, picking up what was left. Well, I'm going to help you to glean from Scripture today that, that you rarely, if ever, hear talked about in all of Christendom out there. It's just something that comes through to me when when I read it and it seems to me to be important. Let's start with chapter 1, verse 1. It says, this is the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David. Okay, I just left off there in the book of Ruth where David was born. So this is the book, this is the family tree of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, who's the son of Abraham, down the line. And here, here's the way it happened. Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judas and his brethren, and Judas begat Pharaoh, and Zarah of Tamar, and Pharaoh begat Israel, and Israel begat Aram. And Aram begat Amenadab. Remember that name? We just saw that a little bit ago. And Amenadab begat Nagasim. And Nagasim begat Salmon. Yeah, see, we saw that name a little bit ago. And Salmon begat Boaz of Rechab. Okay, here it's pronounced Rechab. Uh, if you get the real Bible, the, the King James Version, you've got... Uh, if you got one with the pronunciation helps in it, uh, that ch is pronounced as a k, okay? But it's really the person. The person is not Rachel. It's Rahab. Now, last week we studied Rahab, and we studied the the the. the, the Joshua fighting the battle of Jericho and and the harlot Rahab being okay. okay so so here's here's um, another um, indication that she was a special lady among a group a, a town a population of a couple thousand in the in the in the little city of Jericho that somehow God dealt with her, the Spirit came to her, and she knew that she needed, some, somebody dinged me, did one of you guys send me a <clears throat> So, it's almost as if they said that, uh, Israel is not Israel of the flesh. It's the Israel it's of the Israel. spirit. Yeah. He's a, he's a, a God, God, even long before the New Testament, when Jesus came here and, and accepted the Gentiles, long before then, he was accepting people like he, 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 he picked one. Where's, where's, uh, where's, where's Jericho right there? He, he picked one out of Jericho and, and she was able to save her father and her mother and her brothers and her sisters and all, of, means, huh? all of the kids the, the whole body of Christ now believes that Israel of the flesh and one's counter for the promise <coughs> that's the whole <coughs> idea of dispensation level. let me tell you that the majority is, is never right Tom the, 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 to say the, the, I mean all, all of Christendom preaches and teaches things that they that they stumble over in the Word of God. And 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 long before Jesus came, he was 
He was choosing people like Ruth out of Moab. Now you'll hear sermons preached on you on Ruth, but but the sermons you'll hear preached is about how Boaz let her glean the field and he redeemed her and and they'll try to compare that to Jesus coming and redeeming us and so forth. And and, and I don't mean to disrespect that. I, I really don't. I'm just telling you that today's lesson about Ruth is about real people. It's about circumstances that happen in, 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 in real life. No matter what <coughs> our names are or what the, the tribe we come from, the Spirit of God came, somehow came to James from China or even in China. He said, he said, I always know better. Is his last name Lee? Because I know it's James Lee. <coughs> Now, I don't remember his last name. <laughs> <clears throat> anyway, let me tell you, James moved on from this church only because there were, there were no young Chinese ladies here. So he told me that he was sorry, I mean, that he enjoyed the, <coughs> the, the worship and he enjoyed the lessons and and all of those kinds of things in Sunday school. But... Uh, the Chinese is of the flesh, not of the spirit. Then, yeah. <laughs> so, so he wanted to, uh, you know, find a, a place where uh, people of his culture uh, worship the true and the almighty God, where he might find a young lady and and have a family, so that's why he is is not here today. And I and I hope I hope so much that he succeeded in that, and that things are well with James today, wherever that he is. Let me. I, I, I'm, I'm out of time here, but um, uh, still in verse five, Salmon begat Boaz, or Boaz, it's pronounced here, uh, of Rechab. And Boaz begat Obed of Ruth, and Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat King David. And David the king begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of Urias. Now it doesn't mention her by name here, but we know who that is. That was Bathsheba. Okay. So here there are three women mentioned in Scripture or in, in, in this family tree. The rest are all men. But these women all had some some kind of taint on their occupation or their habitation or They most certainly weren't virgins. They most certainly weren't. That's uh, exactly right. Uh, Pagan. Pagan, anyway. Pagan. Pagan. No. Well, this, well, that's contrary to the law. Contrary to the law. Shows God's grace. Shows a lot of things. So. Verse 7. And Solomon begat Reboam, and Reboam begat Abiah, and Abiah begat Asa, and Asa begat Josaphat, and Josaphat begat Joram, and Joram begat Azirus. And Osiris begat Joatham, and Joatham begat Achaz, and Achaz begat Ezekias, and Ezekias begat Manassas, and Manassas begat Ammon, and Ammon begat Josias, and Josias begat Jeconias and his brother, about the time they were carried away to Babylon. Now we studied that a while back, too, in studying... Uh, the uh, uh, minor prophets. Okay. And after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconias begat Salathiel, and Salathiel begat Zerubbabel. Zer and now elsewhere that's pronounced Zerubbabel. Okay. And that's the same guy that King Cyrus over in Persia appointed as the governor of Jerusalem to go back there and be sure that Jerusalem was rebuilt. 
Okay? And to verse 13, and Zerubbabel begat Abiad, and Abiad begat Eliakim, and Eliakim begat Azer, and Azer begat Sadok, and Sadok begat Achim, and Achim begat Eliad, and Eliad begat Eleazar, and Eleazar begat Mathan, Mathan, and Mathan begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. The family tree of Jesus. So, here, here's one of the things, and, I, and I'll close with this, but I want you to see this. If you haven't noticed this before, the, 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 uh, I'm losing the word that I need right now. I can't find it exact, but the, exactly, but the exactness of, of, of God and in his organization. Verse 17. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. And from David until the carrying away into Babylon are 14 generations. And from the carrying away into Babylon unto Christ are 14 generations. So there's, there's some order to all of this that we have just, uh, have just read and gone through. And then verse 18 starts out with the Christmas story. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. And you, you, you're all familiar with that. Um, any other paganistic thoughts or questions or <laughs> comments? Or? The reason I say that uh, Naomi didn't have much faith is because she told Ruth to go back to her other gods. And that's, I would say that's a, a, a little faith to say something like that. I wouldn't expect anyone of faith to tell someone to go back to their other god. No, generally I'd say you're right. We're trying, our effort is to try to convert people from their other gods to our god. And uh, the problem uh, that that Naomi had, I almost said Naomi. That Naomi had was uh, that women's opinions or attitudes or whatever didn't count. They were they were she she had no right to try to convert her from one god to another. Uh, is is the way society was, uh, but I agree with what you're saying. Is that if she had been uh, as as strong in the faith of uh, our God, the Father, the Creator of all things that's ever been created, then she would have encouraged her to come back to the what we refer to as the Holy Land. Similar to what you were saying about Elimelech. If he would really had faith in God, he may have stayed with that, yeah. in spite of the family. Yeah. You know, uh, rather than going off to a pagan country. Yeah. Which, uh, you know, a show of low faith, you know, yeah. providing. Yeah. And what's, what's interesting to me, too, is because she said she went out full and come back empty. Yeah. Now, is she talking about her husband and her sons, yeah. or is she talking about her wealth? No. Done by her sons, which was the only thing of value to to a woman. I've heard some people suggest that she that they did have money because Boaz had money. He was probably from a family that had money. But nevertheless, he still left because of the famine. Yeah, he he left because he had nothing. Uh, money money wasn't any good. They, they really aren't. They, I could see why somebody could say that because the scripture doesn't really tell you whether or not they had money or not. They could have had money and left regardless just because of the family. But, you know, it's, it's hard to know. So, we don't know. Yeah. But what I tried to do today, as I do from day to day, Sunday to Sunday, 
is, is point out things in the scripture that affect us as human beings that is not written in the scripture. And just talk about the society and the culture and the things that affect us and the decisions that we make. I mean, it's... Uh, but you really out of touch, John. I mean, you're talking about genders and stuff. There's no gender thing anymore. Yeah, I know. Uh, and I know that nobody has any trouble uh, on Sunday morning getting out of bed and getting ready and coming to Sunday school and being here on time. I don't, nobody has any trouble with that. <laughs> it, uh, People are late. <laughs> we, we, we have noticed, Dorothy and I have talked over uh, the years, that uh, Saturday nights are our worst nights. Uh, we don't sleep near as well on Saturday nights as we do other nights. There's always something, it seems like, that messes up the sequence as it should be. And then it's very hard to get up. And then it's very hard to get ready. Uh, but there is a wonderful reward in persevering and in, in doing it anyway. And just poking the devil in the eye, uh, for lack of a better way to put it. And when I said poking the devil in the eye, I looked right at Brad. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he loves me too. <laughs> anyway, any other thoughts or comments? Or? <clears throat> well, thank you for being here, and I will see you next Sunday. Let's pray. Lord, we are indeed grateful. More than I can say, more than we can say, that you are mindful of us, even us that you give us the opportunity to communicate with you, to commune with you, to pray with you, to talk with you, to worship you, to learn of you, to read your word. Thank you, Lord, for being mindful of us. We've come today to not only, and I say this all the time, but we want to learn something of you every week but also to worship you, and we're going to worship you in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, who is indeed our King, our Savior, the Son of the Almighty God. Amen. Amen. God bless you for being in his house today.